welcome back. Yes. How was France? I've just been to Manila. You've been to Manila. Okay. And all those long European vacations. <laughs> just five weeks. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Good. A little bit of an echo in the room here. Um, before we get down to business, and I know you have a lot of questions, I want to point out we have a group of interns here in the back. You know, the summertime, we have a lot of interns who come into your companies and into the State Department as well, and I just want to recognize them. Thank you all for being here. I understand one of you attends the Naval Academy. Which one? Great. Fantastic. Go Navy. Glad to hear it. Got some family there. Um, anyway, welcome, and I hope you've enjoyed your internship and that uh, you've been treated well here and that you've enjoyed it. That's all I have for that, so I'll just take your questions right away. Matt, would you like to start? You're, you're, you're not going to update us on the AGOA conference in Togo? I was really You know, you're going to make some real enemies in Togo. I, I will have you know. I love Togo. Um, let's start again with North Korea. Okay. Um, the president has just come out uh, in New Jersey and said that perhaps his comments of the other day, this is news to you, uh, did the president just, just say this? Yes. Oh, no, I'm not exactly. aware of that yet. What, what did the president said say? said that his fire and fury comment from the other day maybe wasn't strong enough. I'm just wondering if you have any um, comment about that, but I understand if you yeah, don't. Yeah, I'm not aware of the president's uh, comments. I have not heard of, heard those comments myself. Uh, Matt, I trust you. You're um, an excellent reporter. You always get it right. Um, you know, I will say this. Our, our position and our policy and our strategy hasn't changed one bit. So um, does, the, does the secretary, who you speak for, believe that he is a part of the national security team that uh, advises the president uh, on national security issues and, and, and contributes to making policy? I, I'm wondering where you're going to go with this, but yes, absolutely, without a doubt. As you know, the secretary, uh, the president, uh, Secretary Mattis, along with the National Security Council, General McMaster, they meet frequently, they meet often to have conversations about so, national security issues. So then I'm curious about your reaction to some comments that an aide to the president made, uh, Dr. Gorka, mm. to the BBC, and when he was asked about the apparent differences in tone between various officials. He said, you should listen to the president. The idea that Secretary Tillerson is going to discuss military matters is simply nonsensical. It is the job of Secretary Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, to talk about the military options, and he has done so unequivocally. Um, that is his mandate. Secretary Tillerson is the chief diplomat of the United States, and it is his portfolio to handle those issues. Does the Secretary, uh, one, or does this building agree with comments like that, which would seem to suggest that um, the secretary is, this is not the secretary's lane, and that he should kind of, uh, he should butt out and, 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 and keep his mouth shut on things that relate to military matters. Well, the secretary, as you know, he has a close relationship uh, with Secretary Mattis. Our secretary, Secretary Tillerson, talks a lot about our diplomatic strategy and our diplomatic policy. That has not changed. The secretary has been ro very robust in that, just having returned, as we talked about yesterday, from the ASEAN conference where he met for three days with a lot of uh, foreign officials. Uh, as I was coming out here, I heard about Sebastian Gorka's comments. Uh, I didn't hear them myself, uh, so I don't want to comment on exactly what he had to say. But I can say that I speak for Secretary Tillerson and this building. Our secretary has been very clear, as has Secretary Mattis, that our diplomatic and military means are both strong and capable and in the face of the threats that we face against the DPRK or other nations. Right. But does the secretary believe that diplomacy, that, that diplomacy should be combined with, the, with military options and that uh, to produce a successful result? And uh, does he... I, I take it then he, he, he would reject the suggestion that he doesn't have any business talking about I would say that uh, Secretary Mattis um, oversees the U.S. military, and he and Secretary Tillerson have a good, close, cooperative relationship. And one part of our U.S. government is, of course, the State Department, and we do diplomacy here out of this building. Uh, Secretary Tillerson has not spoken about U.S. military capabilities. You all hear me very often from this room when you ask me about U.S. military assets or plans, I refer you to DOD. Right. But the suggestion that was made is that, the, the, that basically the Secretary, Secretary Tillerson shouldn't be involved or shouldn't be listened to 
as it relates to policy towards North Korea. Is that, a, is, that, is that something that you agree with? I think that everyone has clearly heard what Secretary Tillerson's uh, forceful, forceful comments have been and continue to be on the issue of DPRK and on other countries and as they well. should be paid attention to, correct? I would think so, yes. All right, so, so the uh, idea He's a cabinet that... secretary. Uh, he's a fourth in line to the presidency. He um, carries a big stick. And uh, Dr. Gorka is where in that? Line of I, I don't work with Dr. Uh, with Sebastian Gorka. I uh, have known him from a previous life and a previous career, uh, but I have not spoken to him about the comments that he made. Right. And let me Thank just you. leave it at that. Okay. All right. While we're on DPRK, let's uh, stick to that. I'd like to stick to uh, regions if we can today. So, any questions on DPRK? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Rich. Hi, um, and this is in the diplomatic lane, um, talking about mm -hmm. uh, China, uh, South China Sea, mm -hmm. freedom of navigation. China says that the recent U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation operation harms Chinese sovereignty. This is an issue and a response that we've seen before. But do issues like freedom of navigation, some of the economic issues, do they make for a more difficult campaign on North Korea with China? Freedom of navigation operations happen all around the world. Uh, they tend to get the most attention when they happen in the South China Sea. Uh, they happen off the coast of Canada. Uh, they happen w uh, in the waters uh, offshore of our major allies, friends, partners all around the world. That's why we're focusing on it right now. That's why you're asking me that question, because of the issue of DPRK. Uh, as you know, Secretary Tillerson coming back from the ASEAN conference, uh, where there was a joint statement that was issued about the South China Sea. We talked about that pretty extensively yesterday. As you all know, uh, U.S. forces will operate in the Asia-Pacific region. They do that on a daily basis, including the South China Sea. The operations are conducted in accordance with international law. And the point of that is to demonstrate that the United States will continue continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. It's true in the South China Sea. It's true in other places around the world as well. And when the U.S. deals with China, negotiates, speaks with China, um, does it view these issues as compartmentalized or as one big issue? We have lots of ongoing conversations, as you know. We had the, uh, the four-way dialogue uh, with China. We've had two of the four meetings that are set to take place. I believe the next two are set to pl take place later this year. We discuss all kinds of issues. Uh, Secretary Mattis was over here uh, not too long ago, having spoken with uh, Secretary Tillerson and our Chinese counterparts about many of these issues. Among the issues, we talk about the Chinese, uh, South China Sea, of course, but we also talk about DPRK and other matters as well. And so it doesn't hamper the pressure campaign, you don't think? Um, we have at, well, look, you know what happened at the United Nations. The United Nations Security Council unanimously passed um, the new UN Security Council resolution uh, on the DPRK. China was one of those countries that voted along with that. So that means that China has to enforce its sanctions. Uh, they have said that they would. We look forward to and expect them to enforce those sanctions as well. Okay? Okay. And welcome back. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Congratulations on the on the UN Security Council sanctions. Uh, it has been suggested you could have given them longer to bear fruit before threatening fire and fury. Um, it, was it? Uh, how long do you think it would, uh, uh, it'll take before? We see some. Uh, we see North Korea backing down thanks to these sanctions. Well, you know, look, I, I can't speculate as to what North Korea is going to do. Uh, we talked yesterday about our pressure campaign and how the pressure campaign is, in our opinion, working. We've had many countries, countries that we are close friends with, and countries that we aren't as close with help participate in that pressure campaign, and that is because the world recognizes the severe threat that the DPRK faces, not just to the United States, but to the entire world. An element of the, uh, the pressure campaign is yes. a, to seek the diplomatic isolation of North Korea. North Korea obviously attended the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum and has been invited to attend next year's Regional Forum by the, uh, by the hosts. Uh, was that a, a, a failure in an attempt to isolate them diplomatically, or was there some utility in my, my understanding that in terms of invitations like that, the conversations are ongoing. We are not a part of ASEAN, so uh, we do not have the ability to extend or rescind an invitation, so we would leave that up to ASEAN itself. But those nations all joined us in a pretty condemning statement of the activities on the part of the DPRK. Okay. And is it at your understanding that uh, the, uh, the warning that the President issued about fire and fury being visited on, on North Korea 
was uh, if they were to test another missile to form some kind of provocative action, or simply if they resume their normal uh, belligerent rhetoric. I'm just not going to get into any hypotheticals. Okay. When uh, you know yesterday uh, the Kim Jong Un you know laid out uh, first he mm-hmm. ridiculed the president of the United States then well, he laid out the plan Kim for Jong Un attack, is, is for welcome to Iran. he could certainly say you know what he chooses okay I I can't affect that in any kind of way but in terms of the pressure campaign when we talk about it working part of that from the UN Security Council resolution that we believe will help remove about a billion dollars worth of exports uh, money that would go into the pockets of the North Korean regime that money by the way does not get used to feed its own people we know people in that nation North Koreans are starving the money there that goes into North Korea does not go to the people it goes to the government and it's very expensive uh, illegal nuclear and ballistic missile weapons programs and on that point you know one of the the points of the sanctions is to curtail imported labor from North Korea yes. to certain countries and so on Kuwait a country that is an ally of the United States Kuwait uh, said that it will continue to host North Korean workers and laborers and so on uh, do you have any I do. Uh, yeah, what you're talking about is a uh, Associated Press report that came out, I believe it was overnight, that indicated that Kuwait was going to continue hosting North Korean guest workers. That would obviously be a concern to us. There are North Korean guest workers in place around the world. A big part of our pressure campaign, as many of you know, has been saying to those countries through a series of bilateral meetings uh, that Secretary Tillerson and he, uh, here at the State Department has had with many of his counterparts asking other nations to reduce the number of North Korean guest workers. Those guest workers who are working in construction and in other industries and countries around the world are getting that money. That money is going straight back to North Korea into its weapons program. That money does not go to the North Korean individuals themselves. It does not go to the North Korean civilians and citizens and family members. Uh, What you're referring to in terms of Kuwait, we are certainly aware of that report. Uh, It was brought to our attention. I would have to refer you to the government of Kuwait for more information on that. However, uh, we understand that the government of Kuwait will be issuing a statement on those reports and their overall DPRK policy imminently. Uh, We are in close contact with the government of Kuwait. They recognize the serious nature of this issue and the serious nature of that report that did come out. Uh, The government of Kuwait will be taking further measures in response to the dangerous and provocative behavior of the DPRK regime. Uh, Within the coming days, we are told, uh, we are again told to expect a statement on that matter. Okay. When? Because this, I mean, I'm looking at the statement that they sent to us right here, and it's very straightforward. Two questions. Question one, did Kuwait stop issuing new working visas to mm-hmm. North Koreans last year? Answer, no. The state of Kuwait did not stop issuing working visas to North Korean laborers. And then secondly, how many more remaining North Korean laborers work in Kuwait, and does the country have any plans for expelling them? Answer, the number of North Korean laborers in the state of Kuwait is 6,064, and there are no plans. There are no plans to if expel they have 6, North Korean North laborers. North Koreans, Uh, That is why it's an issue that's been brought to our attention. I can't get into uh, the details of any possible uh, private diplomatic conversations, but I am told, and I I think if you look at the timestamp on whenever they sent that to you, I'm told as of about uh, 40 minutes ago or so that an announcement would be forthcoming. Announcement. Do you have any reason to believe that the announcement will be the same as what what I've just read to you? Um, I can tell you that it's an issue of uh, big concern and I can't get into the private diplomatic conversations. Okay. So I hope that helps answer it and, and clarify it. But, but we'll look, look for their statement. We, we will look for their statement, and we will uh, see what happens on that. You know, obviously, the export of labor, as uh, I have mentioned, enables the development of the illicit nuclear and missile program. Uh, the government of Kuwait has been a good friend to the United States. You know, uh, the emir of Kuwait has been extremely supportive, uh, has been helpful, very helpful, as the moderator and mediator in handling uh, the GCC, uh, the Qatar dispute. Uh, we continue to work with that, gum- with that government and work with the emir in, the, in that dispute as well. Okay, anything else on this issue of Kuwait? On, on this issue of Kuwait, yes or no? Okay, all right. Uh, anything else on North Korea? Yes. 
Okay, go right ahead. Hi, Miss. Yes, about the new uh, UN resolution. It yes. also sold resumptions of the six party talks. So we are just wondering that is the U.S. really preparing for the talks and making some contacts? And the second question is about the China's proposal of the. Let, let, me, get your, let me get to your first question okay. first, okay? Will the United States return to talks with North Korea? And the answer to that is, and the Secretary has talked about this a lot, uh, he has said he's not going to negotiate his way back to the negotiating table, okay? He has said that months ago, he's not moved away from that position one bit. Uh, there have been headlines that have been inaccurate that have alluded to the opposite of that. Uh, we would need to know that North Korea is taking serious and literal steps to denuclearizing in order for the United States to even get to that point. Susan Thornton, our Acting Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs, who has been traveling with the Secretary en route back to Washington uh, at this moment from that ASEAN trip, she's been very firm at that. She said something along the lines of, look, we are nowhere near close to that point, especially after we've had two intercontinental ballistic missile tests within uh, less than a month. Uh, they are not showing us, the DPRK is not showing us that they are close to sitting down and talking anytime soon. Okay. Okay, and also about uh, Ms. Thornton, just before the ASEAN trip, Thornton just make a connection between the China's trade with the U.S. and kind of a DPRK's issue. So now China just endorsed or just agree with the U.N. sanctions on the DPRK. So does it mean that the trade relations between China and the U.S. could be kind of okay in the near future? I, I would have to refer you on that trade matter to our trade representative and uh, other people who actually handle that, that trade issue. But look, we um, are pleased with China voting along with the United States and others in that unanimous uh, UN Security Council resolution, and we look forward to China adhering to its commitments on uh, instituting and uh, seeing through those sanctions. Okay, anything, DPRK? Okay. Two related North Korea questions. Oh, the first one is just to clarify, you said um, sending the warship to South China Sea is no way, um, it's not a way the United States is event your frustration on not enough progress on North Korea. Not at all. Look, um, what it takes to move uh, U.S. military equipment and ships is a lot. Uh, those things are pre-planned, and, and DOD can really speak to that. But those things have been planned for a long, long time. The United States does these operations, the freedom of navigation operations, all around the world. Uh, many times of year, and in fact, I probably have some uh, facts and figures for you on that. But uh, this is nothing new. We've done it before. We'll continue to do that. Given the timing, as China and ASEAN just reached the frame of code of conduct in South China Sea, isn't this move counterproductive and actually inflame the tension in South China Sea? And as a matter of fact, the United States just endorsed the frame of code of conduct in South China Sea. Yes, we did. And we are in compliance and adherence with that. Uh, this is a, a, a somewhat of a complex legal matter. So I want to read from you some of this so that there's no confusion uh, on the part of folks across the world. We have a comprehensive freedom of navigation operations program under which the U.S. forces challenge excessive maritime claims around the globe to demonstrate our commitment to uphold the rights, freedoms, and uses of the sea and airspace guaranteed to all nations under international law. All nations, that is guaranteed to the United States and to other nations as well. That's why I mentioned we do these freedom of navigation operations off the coast of Canada, for example, along with many other places. FONOPs, as we refer to it, are not about any one country. They're not about making a political statement. In 2016, and here's the number I referred to, we conducted these challenging excessive maritime claims in 22 different coastal states, including claims of allies and partners as well. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, somebody had something over here about China. Is China doing enough on North Korea? Are you satisfied with the, what they are doing? You know, uh, the Secretary has spoken to this issue a lot. Is China doing enough? And one of the things that he's consistently said is that we see some movement on the part of China, but that movement and uh, that engagement can be uneven at times. But look, I, he had conversations uh, with many partners uh, on his recent trip to ASEAN. Uh, we think we've made some additional progress in there. Uh, they certainly recognize uh, what instability in that region means for their nation. Uh, they also jumped on board with that United Nations Security Council resolution, so we're pleased with that. But we yeah. look forward and hope that they will do more. You have been saying the pressure is working, but the facts... That the what? You have been saying that the pressure on North Korea is working, but the facts speak otherwise. They have done two 
ICBM tests in less than a month. They have threatened to uh, uh, fire missiles in Guam. So what do you say about that? You know, it doesn't this, seem that pressure is working on them. Look, this pressure campaign is going to take a while. We've always recognized that. It took us many, many years to get to this uh, concerning point where the United, uh, United States and the world are right now with the DPRK. We can't expect that this is going to change overnight. This pressure campaign is going to take some time. Part of that pressure campaign is removing the money that North Korea gets for its weapons programs. Uh, we believe that through time and through talking to other countries about what those countries can do to reduce the number of guest workers, to uh, reduce the size of embassies and missions in Pyongyang and in other places around the DPRK, that that will help remove some of the funding for that. Okay. Enough, there, there is the luxury of some, I don't want to say luxury, but you have time because I, th I think what this week has shown us um, in terms of the miniaturization report, um, that there may not be enough time to, for, to, to, to let these things that, play I, out I their, want to point out that report course. that you just mentioned, a lot of people have asked about that. That would be an intelligence matter that I can't well, confirm, and I will not have nothing to say to hear about that. Right. But I'm not asking about the report. Okay. I'm just saying that. Well, you referenced it, so I right, just wanted right. to make but that the, clear. But developments over the course of the last couple weeks yeah. have made it clear, I think, to everyone that time is not necessarily on your side here, that the things that the North Koreans are progressing much more quickly than had been anticipated, expected, or theorized. But we're, and, we're and without a doubt concerned about that. Right. But the question, so my question to you is, are you confident that there is time to allow these sanctions and the pressure campaign to work, that you have the time for that to work before they do something rash? I think, I think the best thing that I can say about that is referencing something that the Secretary said yesterday, and that is that Americans can sleep safely at night. So that's the thing that, 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 that Dr. Gorka said not that there was pure non, <laughs> nonsense and shouldn't be listened to. I would refer you back to Mr. Gorka on that one. Can we go to Syria? Okay. okay. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? Yeah. DPRK. Are yeah. we yeah. done with DPRK? Can we go to Cuba? Okay. I, I feel like an auctioneer. Are we <laughs> done with DPRK? Yeah, no. Is that a yes? Yes? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, Miss, tell me your name again. Jessica Stone. All right. Nice hey, Jessica. Good to see you. Um, two more questions on DPRK. First of all, Japan is moving missile interceptors. Um, in order to be in a position to intercept anything that hits Guam, and they've said that they're willing to defend the U.S. in the context of what's going, the threats that have been made by the DPRK. Can you give us some insight into whether they're sort of overstepping their commitments under the a mutual defense treaty that they have with the United States? Are they required to go to those lengths? Um, do you have any insight into that? I, I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't. Um, Got something else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did, you sparked something in my head, but um, I know there's been a lot of writing, of, and maybe you could say ink spilled even over the sort of dissonance between the messages on DPRK out of this building versus mm -hmm. the sort of more synergy we've seen from the White House and the Pentagon. Um, is that strategic that we're seeing Tillerson push the diplomatic option and we're seeing the President and Mattis push military consequences if the diplomatic, dipl diplomatic um, response does not work? You know, this is something uh, that we covered yesterday. Our policy across the administration is the same. The policy is we want a denuclearization of the North Korean Peninsula, or of the Korean Peninsula. We want, we expect North Korea to denuclearize. We would like them to be able to come to the, uh, you know, the, the global, um, you know, the global world of uh, countries that can cooperate together. They are isolating themselves. Uh, it's something that's of grave concern to us, and that's why we continue to push this as the top national security priority for the United States at this time. And lastly, do you have a working estimate of how soon you think that the DPRK would collapse? <laughs> I do not. That is, that's quite a hypothetical. I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Are we done with DPRK? Okay. Let's go to Cuba. Okay. Go right ahead. Hi. How are you? Do you have any update, uh, I know it's just recent, on the diplomats and the hearing loss issue, but moreover, does the State Department have any plans for reversing the Obama administration's efforts to uh, diplomatic ties with, with Cuba? In other words, reversing the, yeah. you know, restoring them, reversing that action? So I, I don't have any information on that particular part 
for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, particular medical ailments. That is nothing that I can confirm. I've certainly seen that report out in the news media. I hope that those reports would not come from any federal officials. Uh, we will not confirm the health status of any Americans, whether they're in Cuba, back here at home, or elsewhere. What I can tell you is that uh, these were U.S. government personnel who were in Cuba, in Havana, on official duty on behalf of the U.S. government. Uh, we consider these to be incidents because we still are trying to work, uh, determine the actual cause of uh, their situation. Uh, they have had a variety of physical symptoms. That's as far as I can go in describing that. Uh, we just don't have the definitive answers yet. This is an active on investigation, and that investigation is ongoing at this time. So what, what about the overall diplomatic relationship between Cuba and the United States? Are there any plans to change what the Obama administration put into place? You know, there are – this is a situation that we're still assessing. When I say an active investigation is underway, in part what that means is we don't know exactly where uh, this came from, okay? We can't blame any one individual or a country at this point yet. An investigation is underway. We take that very seriously. Uh, this is a U.S. government investigation that is taking place. We've spoken extensively to the Cubans about this. Uh, as you know, we had two of their Cuban diplomats leave back in, uh, in late May or so. Uh, we do and, – and the reason that we had them leave is because we said that this is the uh, agreement that the United, uh, United States, rather, has with Cuba, and that is that they are responsible for the safety and security of our, dip, of our diplomats while our diplomats are serving in that country. Our Americans were not safe. They were not secure, obviously, because something has happened to them. We take that very seriously. The safety and security of Americans at home and abroad is our top issue. We'll continue to investigate that. Global Affairs okay. Canada. Uh, hold Global on. Affairs hold Canada. On. Hold, hold on. Are you done, ma'am? Yes. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Global Affairs Canada, as you might know by now, says its diplomats have been experiencing the same unusual symptoms. Uh, and it's working with the U.S. and Cuba to investigate. Is the U.S. working with any other country to investigate these incidents? I won't comment on anything related to another country. I can't confirm that. I can only talk about the American piece of it. And let me just ask you about Congress. Um, this news seemed to catch uh, several key lawmakers in Congress off guard that deal with Cuba. And at least one U.S. senator has requested a classified briefing from the State Department. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't the State Department, if it care so much about what's going on with, with his diplomats, alerted Congress. There have been conversations that have been going on between uh, the interagencies, and uh, the, I assume and that means Congress as well. So Congress, uh, certain folks have been, I can't tell you exactly who, I don't know off the top of my head, but have been made aware of this. This is not something that, uh, you know, certain members of Congress are learning about for the well, first time. Let me show this. Why are we just learning about this? this these two Cuban <laughs> diplomats left on May the 23rd. This has been going on at least eight or nine months, and now we're just learning about this? Why? As a reporter, you're going to ask me that question? Yeah. I mean, goodness, you could have been down there reporting on this. Look, no, uh, the honest question is, and the, and, and the real answer to this is, people started experiencing ailments in late 2016, okay? And think about it. When you have an ailment, you don't always know exactly what's causing it, okay? You have that ailment, you maybe decide to put it off for a while, get medical treatment, maybe not, okay? Some of these things take time to investigate. Um, in particular, ones that are people aren't certain what has caused them. So this takes time to figure out. That is why I say an investigation is ongoing. We have pro provided medical care and medical treatment and screening to our Americans who have asked for that. Um, some people have been brought home as a result. So I kind of take issue with the tone of your question as though we don't care about this. I think we've been clear in our responsibility and our, let me finish, and our concern about Americans who are serving on behalf of the U.S. government and other countries. Do you think those diplomats that have been experiencing these symptoms are satisfied with the response they've gotten from the State Department? I don't know the answer to that. Yes. One, without getting into any specific country, uh, names of other countries that might have had diplomats involved, are you aware of that, that diplomats from other countries were uh, had su suffered similar uh, physical I have uh, seen symptoms? reports, and, that, and that's all I can say about that. Okay, but so you don't uh, – so you're unable to, to say whether or not this was only – something that happened to Americans. I, I just can't confirm here uh, from a U.S. government post 
that uh, other countries may have or have not uh, had the same issue happen to them. I can only speak to what Americans have faced. Can we go to Syria? Okay. Are we in Cuba? Hi. Hey. Um, you seem to be open the possibility that another country is involved. In some I, I didn't. I didn't. This guy right here next to you did. Uh, sorry. Apologies. Not a, a, that someone else has been attacked, but that they seem to be the, the possibility of a third country being involved in the attacks themselves, as in it might not be the Cubans who are uh, behind the idea. I, so, you, I know people want answers. I, I appreciate that, okay? But this is an ongoing investigation. We don't have all the answers yet. So I, I appreciate that you want to try to push me to say something. I'm not going to get ahead of the investigators. I'm not going to get, get ahead of this investigation. I'm not going to create, um, you know, storylines for you that don't match up with the facts as we know them right now, okay? So I'm not going to get into that. It is an area that is under investigation that is a major concern of ours. Can you say... Uh, if going back and research that mm -hmm. this building has seen anything similar to this, you know, in, um, Matt, that's a past? good that's a good question. Um, I have whether not, it's in Cuba or yeah, anywhere else. I, I'm not I'm not personally aware of that. I can certainly ask uh, some of our folks who have been around for longer than I have about that. Let's see what I can. That get would for be you. pretty much everyone in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's I've not been the, here three months not, now. Not <laughs> and, then, so, and then the last thing on this. You've seen the, the response or the statement that the Cuban government put out last night saying that um, it would, does not condone any, uh, you know, would not allow any kind of um, uh, inter inter interference with, with foreign diplomats and that it, it, it takes seriously mm -hmm. and respects its Vienna uh, uh, Convention obligations. Do you accept that? You know, I would just say this uh, uh, about what you mentioned. We remain in regular contact with the Cuban government. They are providing some guidance, uh, some assistance on this investigation as the investigation is underway. Uh, we, in that regular contact, uh, we hope to resolve this matter in a satisfactory fashion. And let me just leave it at that, okay? Right. But I just want to, I mean, do you take at face value when they, it, do you, do you accept it that they respect? I mean, you made a big point yesterday mm -hmm. of talking about the Vienna Convention and how Cuba mm -hmm. has obligations under it to protect uh, foreign. Yeah, uh, and, and they talked about that. Yeah, but uh, right, and they say that they do, but yeah. clearly, you don't think that. Well, look, I, I think they do. U.S. government officials have been affected in some yeah. way by these incidents, physically affected by these incidents. Uh, it is. Uh, the Cuban government's obligation under the Geneva Convention, uh, excuse me, under um, uh, Vienna. Vienna, thank you, uh, under Vienna Conventions to uh, ensure the safety and protection mm -hmm. of our diplomats there. But you, so you're, I, I think what you're saying is that despite the statement from last night, you're still not convinced. Uh, they have an obligation to do that, and that obviously did not happen. Okay. Yes, Anything? Are we done with Cuba? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of going on that. Yeah. Of staffing levels at the mission returned to the levels they were before the incidents came to light? Uh, I, I can tell you this, that our embassy there in Havana, in Havana is fully operational. It is uh, fully staffed. Uh, they are still uh, involved in business um, as a uh, precaution and for concern and the well-being of our embassy staffers there. We've allowed a limited number of personnel to curtail their tours of duty, and what that can mean is that some of them can transfer posts, come home if they want, or uh, try to go elsewhere. But well, wait a second. If the embassy is fully staffed, yeah. that means that however many number left that you reciprocated by telling the Cubans that they had to take two, they had to get two out, if you're saying it's now fully staffed, can't can the Cubans bring their two guys back or two diplomats back? We brought our people home um, out of care and concern for their medical well-being. But if they've well -being. been replaced and you're now fully staffed and you're back up at the number well, of Well, I don't know if that we're, you know, this is where you guys want to get into the number of people at our embassies. And I'm not going to do that, as you know that. I mean, I don't know if we're down one or if we're up one in terms of our well, embassy well, personnel. That Fully staffed. Fully that staffed means we have people doing I, the job. Heather, I understand that. But if you, if, you, if you told the Cubans they had to lose two diplomats from there, embassy here because it, in a reciprocal manner because you lost the two from uh, I have never lost, I have never okay, indicated because any you number. lost the number you lost the number from there and now you say it's fully staffed that would suggest that however many people left from your embassy 
are now back. Look, I'm not going to get down this rabbit would, hole and, of numbers. And that of would people. mean then yeah. that it is no longer necessary for the Cuban embassy to be down. Not, I'm, to I'm not. Staffers. I'm not going to draw that conclusion. We are open for well, business. This is pretty standard but diplomacy. We are. We are. Hold on. We are open for business. Mm -hmm. There are people there mm -hmm. doing the work. If we're up one, down one, I'm not going to get into those kinds of details. Okay, but just understand that the work is being done there. Okay. Okay. Are we? We're done with this now. Okay. Okay. Stop? Has this her acoustic harassment Some, stopped? I, look, I'm not going to confirm or deny uh, what you're saying. Um, we'll get a lot of leading questions here today. Uh, this remains an ongoing investigation concern, and I'm not going to get into that any further. Okay, no, I'm, I'm, stop, I'm done go with Cuba you? right Jack? now. I've answered can all I that I can you? for you. Hold yeah. up. I've answered all that I can for you on Cuba. I know you still have questions. I'm not able to provide you all of the answers, okay? Syria? Investigation ongoing, period. Syria? Can we go to okay. Syria? Let's, uh, fine, yes, let's go thank to Syria. You, Heather. Yes, uh, first of all, could you update us on what is happening in the battle uh, for, for Raqqa and what is U.S. involvement? There are talks about uh, the U.S. establishing a base near there and so on. So could you update us on that yeah, in a second? Look, I, when you mention any U.S. military facility, that would be a DOD matter. So I, I would not get into that. Okay. Okay. All right. Then let, let me ask you about the, the ceasefire. Uh, would you characterize that uh, U.S.-Russian cooperation in, in Syria as remaining the same as it was when, when this thing started out? Uh, for the ceasefire, and second... Uh, let let me answer that, okay. that first question, then I'll get to your next one, okay? So uh, what you're referring to is the ceasefire that has uh, been underway for about a month now. I think it was the 9th or so of July. We can double-check that. Um, but for about that period of time in southwestern Syria, this is one that was negotiated between the United States, Russia, and other places. And the point of that was to find an area of cooperation where the United States and Russia could find, I mean, we have a, uh, a low-level relationship with Russia. We all know that. That's, that's no surprise here. But we want to find areas of mutual cooperation where we can work together. And this is one area that ceasefire, um, to my understanding, is still holding. Okay, we are pleased with that. That provides the United States and the coalition partners with the opportunity to start to get some humanitarian in that is so badly needed in that area. And so uh, humanitarian aid, and I have a little bit of detail uh, for you on that, uh, we've been able to start reaching some of the vulnerable Syrians um, without the complications of avoiding airstrikes or increases in violence. We're continuing to work with our international partners to assess the ongoing emergency humanitarian needs throughout Syria and facilitate the delivery of vitally needed supplies. I'm also told that people are um, starting to slowly come back into uh, parts of those areas, which is uh, you know, which would, we would consider to be a, a moderate success at this point, and we look forward to that happening eventually. And my last question on yes. this very point. It seems that when the ceasefire was negotiated, it was done between the United States, Russia, Jordan, and Israel, and Israel was opposed to the ceasefire. I wonder if you've seen these reports, and why would the United States not take into consideration Israel's concerns in this case? You know, I, or did I, they have real, real I have concerns? I have seen that report. Um, we're not going to discuss our diplomatic conversations uh, on that or on other matters. Uh, we're committed to regular consultations uh, with our partners in the region, and that, of course, includes Israel. We talk with them uh, very often, as you all know. Uh, the consultations have been extensive, and they are ongoing. Okay. And we have to wrap it up in just a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. in, in light of uh, Erdogan's public statements on Saturday about the dangers that the uh, YPG, as he sees it, poses to Turkey, and the buildup of Turkish forces in the south, are you concerned about a Turkish attack on Kurdish areas in Syria? So what I want to say about this is, of course, Turkey is an important and valued NATO ally. Uh, the United States takes Turkey's concerns seriously. We have a lot of ongoing conversations with the government of Mr. Erdogan. Uh, they have legitimate concerns with the PKK. We understand that. Um, they are concerns about the region overall, and we condemn ongoing attacks committed by the UKK. We can, uh, excuse me, the PKK, and we consider that to be a terror organization. But if okay. Turkey were to move on on Syria, you would oppose it. I, I, that, that's a hypothetical, and I'm just not going to get into a hypothetical. China. Okay. Okay. China. Um, okay. Go right ahead, China. Yeah. Um, 
what is the U.S. position on the ongoing, because the dip bilateral diplomatic efforts have failed. So what is uh, your position on China, India? This, it's been seven weeks on the border, the mm -hmm. military tensions that are going on. If you yeah, have anything. It, it's a situation that we have certainly uh, followed closely. And as you know, we have relationships with both governments. We continue to encourage both parties to sit down and have conversations about that. And I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, okay. sir. Just, just one more. And that is the Indian Prime Minister um, a couple of hours ago tweeted that look forward to Ms. Ivanka Trump presence at Hyderabad. But the point is, as the leader of the U.S. delegation, and the, as you were earlier saying, that this is the building that takes care of the diplomatic. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, give anything about the U.S. delegation and what kind of compr uh, comprised of? I, I, under, I hear you. I'm hearing this for the first time that the prime minister tweeted this. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a very good relationship with him, and we enjoyed having him here uh, in the United States about a month or so ago. I just don't have any travel to give you at this time. When I do, I will make that available. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, la last question in Afghanistan. Hi. What's your stand on Senator McCain's Afghanistan strategy, which you unveiled this morning? Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly aware of um, uh, Senator McCain's proposal. Uh, by the way, it was great to see Senator McCain back here in Washington just a few weeks ago. Uh, a uh, very strong and tough man, and uh, as someone whose own father experienced the same illness that he had, I was really proud to see him walk back into Washington. Uh, that personal note aside, uh, let me just say the Afghan review policy, which I know a lot of people are very curious about, is still underway. There have been a lot of conversations and negotiations uh, with the President's national security team. Of course, that includes Secretary Tillerson as part of that. Uh, we are looking at this as not just a solution to Afghanistan, but also a uh, a, a broader concern that incorporates India and Pakistan as well as a regional solution. We just don't have that plan. And, and by the way, the White House will uh, roll out that plan, but we just don't have that done uh, just yet. It's still under review. Okay. So on your personal side about Senator McCain, yeah. it was great to see him back. You said I'm in so Washington. happy to see him back. Yeah. Right. What did you think of his vote? Uh, <laughs> of his vote on health care? I'll leave that to Senator McCain. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you.